Good morning, everybody. Um, beautiful day, isn't it? On the golf course, this is what this is what you want to see. All the difference a week makes. As Pat indicated, um, I'm a technical director. I work with our consultants across the country with schools, uh, as well as do seminars and training and put together resource materials and all of that. Today's presentation, this is a brand new one I put together. I always try to challenge myself and develop something new so we're not talking about slip, trip, and ball. I mean, you know, who wants to do an hour of slip, trip, and ball? Uh, but it's important. Uh, today we're going to talk about commonly overlooked safety inspections. They, and it's going to be a lot of pictures, and I always like to teach the pictures as opposed to a lot of words. Uh, yes, um, this is something that you may want to take back to your schools or your facility people. But keep in mind, uh, I see the next topic on the agenda is active intruder. And having a safe premises, having safe practices and all that is a component of what you want to do to address school violence. So a lot of what we'll talk about as far as things that apply to overlook safety inspections, things that can present hazards in schools, can have an impact on school violence, active intruder, as well as sexual misconduct. Uh, we're not talking about sexual misconduct, but some of these issues that you can see in today's presentation may have a rise of being able to present opportunity for sexual misconduct to occur. So Pat talked you, gave you a little bit of background. Um, I can't believe I've been in 10 years now in risk control. Uh, I got into risk control mainly for schools because of my claims experience. Uh, 25 years um, in claims, a lot of it in schools, including the state of Illinois. So. Uh, you're going to see some claim photos and some claim stories that will come out of today's presentation. Uh, all the difference a week makes. Aren't you glad we're not in uh, North Carolina today? Uh, in your New Hanover schools, New Hanover County schools is Wilmington. And uh, last week this time, I was being kicked out of the state. They have a statewide annual conference on Wrightsville Beach, of which I'm part of. And then uh, the hotel kicked us out and sent, us, sent me on our way closed the conference down as soon as, as a matter of fact, I was going to do this presentation a week ago today, but got canceled due to the hurricane. So you guys are going to be the first group to see this program. So with that, let's get started. And again, if you have questions, comments, you want to share stories, um, I encourage that uh, because I don't think I can get any more of a challenging crowd. I did a program last year for the Indiana Department of Ed on, uh, on making an informed decision on Army school staff. And you're talking about some people that had some opinions that voiced their concern about that. I was neither pro or against, but given the schools enough information to, for them to make their own decision. And you can see that got a lot of debate. So let's get started talking about some commonly overlooked uh, inspections for schools. Uh, I love this quote, vision is the art of seeing what is invisible to others. Meaning that you may have people you walk through it may be you, you've always done it that way, or you've not ever seen the exposure, and all of a sudden you see it. Uh, school in uh, Mississippi are the photos. Again, I told you I love to teach the photos. Uh, we were doing a traffic analysis, walked out of the high school. Uh, the exit is where that blue arrow is. There's a uh, dumpster fence, privacy fence, uh, exit to the high school right in front of the line of buses. Is that safe? And, you know, the school didn't realize it. We pointed it out. We basically said, hey, you've, you've got a big obstruction. You've got a big exposure here. And they go, wow, it's always been like that. We never saw it. So that kind of illustrates what the quote there is. Hopefully, before these things turn into losses, or if they turn into losses elsewhere, we can point it out to you, and you can go back to your own school districts and say, hey, um, you know, maybe we need to think about a corrective action because we may have something similar here. So that's kind of the reason why I like photos. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about inspections, talk about ways to proactively address some of the resources from a national perspective. You've got a, a, a hard copy of the presentation. Pat indicated that you got the digital version too that's got the photos. So uh, maybe something that you want to ask to take back with you. Um, I always emphasize the basics. Pat's going to recognize this slide from CSRM because I can't tell you how many times in dealing with schools we look at controlling the exposure or we're looking at let's get a waiver of liability and we've not thought through the basics of risk identification and risk analysis. So whenever I do a presentation, I can't tell you how many times in my day-to-day -day job I go back and say let's think about the basics before we jump into this exposure. 
Um, I took a picture out and substituted another one. Had a, we got a $3 million slip, trip, and fall loss going on an entrance to a schoolway. And uh, it had to do with some deteriorated concrete in the threshold. A uh, 50, 50 year old uh, woman, um, a grandmother, I believe, tripped and fell. And uh, how can you have a $3 million slip, trip, and fall? Well, she had pre existing conditions. She fell, and as a result of the fall, needed her leg amputated. And you had to have a life care plan developed for a 50 year, year old uh, all the way through the remainder of her life. That's where, you know, claims assessed about a 50% comparative fault on it. So they feel the school's got a $1.5 million exposure on a slip, trip, and fall. That's the red arrow at the top there. So if you address things at the bottom, and that's kind of the bulk of today's presentation, talking about inspections, talking about looking at things before they turn into incidents or accidents, you can avoid the serious loss. Um, inspection and maintenance programs. This is kind of getting what I was talking, what I was opening it up first. If you're looking at addressing school violence, this is one of the components that you want to look at and address. Safety and security first starts with having and maintaining safe, safe facilities and safe premises because uh, a school obviously is more than just a building. Uh, so you want a good maintenance and inspection program. Uh, these things can identify issues before they turn into events. And you can utilize checklists and all that. I got another slide that talks a little bit about that a little bit later on. It's important to keep records for documentation. State has a state retention record schedule. Um, it's good for um, litigation. I think our attorneys will speak to that too about the importance of documentation. And it's being proactive, not reacting to loss, but something that you want to do from a proactive basis. Um, these are just some of the things at the top. That's an Illinois school, by the way. Um, a lot of these pictures I took myself. But the reason I put those two pictures there I was going in with the newer consultant this year. It was the early part of the year. We were, we were walking through a school in Illinois. And um, I pulled him aside, school transportation, school bus garage. And I said, um, I said, let's get some pictures. And he looked at me and he goes, what, why? Uh, there's no problems here. And I said, that's the point. Uh, inspection shouldn't be all negative. Let's point out the fact that, man, this, this is really sharp and clean and let's bring that to a positive. Because you're gonna see on the next photos uh, same school district, but issues where, where it was a problem. So whenever you do your inspections, whether it's on a building, mechanical, heating, electrical, or in campus or anything like that, point out the good as well as the bad. And, you know, um, reward your people too, uh, because the uh, manager of the school transportation, we, we got his name in the report saying, you guys really do a great job here. We wish that they, um, the other departments, you can see same school district on the right, their welding class, their school um, auto shop, had issues, we were basically saying, it's, it's the same kind of exposure, why can't your school technical labs look like this? And uh, you can see the material was dumped right uh, to the right there, right here, let me see if I can get that. That's the storage closet. So you've gotta walk over and walk out of that every time that you wanna go back in. So that's a problem. Frequency of inspections, um, it, it really depends upon usage, what you're looking at and inspecting, what's, uh, what's the operation. Uh, something that we get requested a lot of times, how often should uh, playgrounds be inspected? Well, um, it depends upon the use. The equipment, not a bad idea to inspect the Monday morning before school starts during the school year. So a lot of, a lot of things to think about for frequency of inspections. Uh, this kind of gives you some um, guidance on what to look at from a frequency perspective. Um, for roofs, obviously roofs are a major expense for schools. Any large commercial building, um, anything on the back side of a roof of 10 years plus, you're more susceptible, in, you know, especially in Illinois, uh, Indiana, and the Midwest, not only do you have hail, but you've got wind. So uh, making sure that you look after any significant weather event you can see the top picture there, that's a failure waiting to happen. And I can't tell you um, a number of times, either the claims people or the risk control people, you get up on the roof and you see that uh, maybe nobody's been up there in a long time. Uh, the gutters are clogged, the drains are clogged, or you can see algae growing or issues like this. So these are just some good elements there as far as how often should you um, inspect some of these things. You can see that um, HVAC unit right there is pretty much battered by hail. 
um, having appropriate hail guards and all that may be something that you want to think from a risk management perspective. Uh, one of the things that you don't want to do is you don't want me to live close to your school district. <laughs> you're, gonna, you're going to see pictures like this. The frequency of inspections, we talked about playgrounds. Um, you can see that's washed away. And uh, the school, every, and I'm sure your schools are like this too, if they do come out every July, you fill the loose fill with ground cover and off you go for the next school year. Only problem with this district here, this is an elementary school, this is the parking lot behind the school building and it's crowned. And they don't have the drainage of, uh, set appropriately. So the first significant rainstorm is gonna wash out all your ground cover and you're gonna leave that for the year until next July. So you need to do things, not only do you need to inspect it, but you need to do the, corrective, the, the appropriate corrective action that goes with it too. Um, these are just some guidance, building perimeter, you know, when, uh, change of season's a good time to do inspections, entryways all the time, especially after weather events or before weather events. Um, doors um, and all that are a good thing to look at for inspections, um, attic, major storms, again, you're talking about roof, don't forget about your basements, crawl states and, and, and all of that, as far as areas for inspections. The, uh, pretty nice here, you're gonna see some pictures where some of the boiler rooms and all that may not look so good in storage areas. What, um, what I would do, and I think I've got some slides here that I'll speak to this, is consider taking a look at all of your storage spaces, including some of your closets. And a lot of times you, you have them, you may have instructors and all that that may have secret areas that they use for storage or whatever, but not a bad idea to think about inspecting all of your storage areas. You're gonna see some pictures on why that may be a good idea. Um, you're gonna see some more pictures about storage, about blocking uh, electrical components, fire uh, suppression components, some things like that. That can be bad from a code perspective as well as a health, life, and safety. Um, maintenance tips, and again, I know that um, you, you guys aren't the facility people, but hopefully you'll take this presentation back to your facility people. Uh, this is a picture from a, didn't, it doesn't really have anything to do with maintenance except it's talking about bathrooms and rules for bathrooms. School in South Carolina I went to early part of the year. Um, I really like the rules that they posted in the bathroom in the elementary school. So I took a picture of it. If you're looking at violence, uh, codes of conduct, um, uh, child behavior expectations and all that, I thought that was really a good sign that they posted in all the bathrooms. But um, you want to have, you want to make sure that your maintenance people, your facility people, they're properly trained, you've got the written protocols, policy and procedures, you keep and maintain inspection logs. And I got the other slide that will speak a little bit more in depth about that. But you wanna recognize and address issues as quick as possible. Um, follow directions of cleaning products, cleaning products, uh, a lot of chemicals in a school, whether it's maintenance, science class, um, you know, um, the, you know, the uh, yard people, or the maintenance people and all of that. Uh, so you have to take a look and make sure that, that you have the chemical exposure addressed too. Uh, addressing weather events, wet floor signs, all of that can lead to issues for inspections and, and accidents and serious loss. Here's a picture here, We're talking a little bit about inspection checklists. Not a school, but schools do have pools and they've got Legionella exposure. This came from a hotel um, in, in, the south, or in the southwest a great big Legionella claim. They go to, to pull, the claims people go to pull the inspection log on the spa. You can see it right there. Um, so, and that kind of, you basically, you're not doing the proper inspections, you're not recording uh, according to state code. And um, it basically puts claims in a position of having to write a check. Uh, I put this in here, inspection checklists. Earlier part of this year, I was on a panel discussion, we were talking about parking lots. Um, for the National Retail and Restaurant Defense Association. And um, I'm on a panel with an engineer and an attorney, and I'm representing <coughs> risk control. And we're talking about inspection and checklists. The attorney and the engineer are, are recommending that you don't complete them. We're saying don't complete inspection checklists. And I'm going, what? I, I mean, we had this talk beforehand. We did some prep, so I wasn't surprised during the conference. But in essence, the reasoning is the same. It's the same problem that, that I have, that everybody has. The reason that the engineer and the attorney are saying don't do them is because uh, 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 entities don't do
do them correctly or they do them improperly, they don't, or they're incomplete, and they present issues for the defense. <laughs> so I'm saying it's important to do them, but you have to do them correctly. Meaning that if you go through and you have a mandatory inspection log and the employee, or you have a requirement that you fill out an inspection log and the employee does it at the end of the week or at the end of the month and they fill it in, and it, uh, and it contains falsified data or uh, uh, information that was retroactively placed in, it's going to call into question your whole safety efforts your whole safety efforts for your entire school district or your entire company. So it's important that you, it, that you do them, but to understand that to do them correctly, meaning that you know, if you're writing the time that you went in uh, the day and the time that you filled it out that you inspected the bathroom or you inspected the floor log or whatever, it's filled out completely and correctly. Um, and, and if that's not the case, you know, it, it almost defaults in what the defense attorney and the engineer said about, you know, if you're going to go back and fill it in with fraudulent information, just don't do it at all, because it's going to work against you. Um, with uh, inspection checklists, they're good. Um, they, can, uh, they can call attention, they highlight important areas for you to think about, uh, for, your, for your inspector to address. Know that from a weakness standpoint, um, you don't get a lot of detail, they're standardized, you may not have a lot of flexibility. So it's pros and cons. What you may want to do is take some of these templates, and I know your insurance carriers have a lot of inspection <coughs> templates. Take a look at them and don't use them boilerplate, but look to adapt to your specific school for your specific needs. If you have a playground inspection checklist, you may want to modify that for the pieces of equipment that you have on that playground. I was working with a school last week in North Carolina they, they put in a brand new playground, $200,000 worth of equipment going into a playground, only to find out that the, uh, the playground equipment, the standards, um, was not met. And they've got a great big issue because the installer that put it in says that it, that, that it did, but in looking at the pictures and all that, it's gonna be a big legal issue. So um, uh, uh, use inspection checklists, adapt them to your specific needs. Boilerplate and templates are good, but What's better is to adapt them to what you, you specifically need them for and to do them correctly. The exterior inspections, um, you want to take a look at, and again, I'm not getting into a lot of slip, trip, and fall, but um, hotel pictures in the bottom. Take a look at, that's an entrance to the hotel. Right here is your um, ADA parking. And what do you have? You're, you're putting your more medically challenged people and looking at the hazards that they have to come up against. So take a look at your outside inspections, your parking lots, your sidewalks and all of that. Um, you've got special needs students uh, that I've seen some serious losses on loading and unloading, falling out of wheelchairs, uh, going down over curbs, issues like that, as well as medically challenged, you got, may have grandmother's day. Uh, and if you've got issues like this, or if you've got problems with the entrance or whatever, can cause problems with uh, getting in and out of um, a school building or onto school property. Um, parking lot safety. I can't, um, one of the things that, that we do that I enjoy doing is looking at uh, school traffic analysis, school observation of coming in and out of a school building every day. And I'm not trained, I'm not specifically trained as an engineer or architect, but just from a common sense perspective of what goes on at 3.30 or 3 o'clock or whenever you let out your school building because it not that organized chaos every day? You've got, especially in your high school and all of that, your, your elementary schools, you've got parents lined up, uh, you've got school buses, you've got everybody leaving at the same time. And taking a look at parking lot safety, traffic coming in and traffic coming out of the buildings is important. Last year, last summer, um, last July, I did a hotel uh, Safety Institute. This is Denver, Colorado. And um, uh, this hotel here is where we had the conference. And you can see a major expressway here, a major expressway there. You've got a hotel here, you've got restaurants and retails, you've got a parking garage. And as the entrance and exit to all these hotels, the hotel front entrance to where we had um, uh, this meeting, this uh, training session like we're doing today, which it, it basically is. Uh, all the traffic seems to converge in that area right there. 
the reason I'm, I'm talking about this, we spent a whole day talking about safety and security for hospitality like we're doing today for schools. I had somebody get hit in, by a car in a parking lot during that event. Uh, it illustrated everything that we were talking about. And a lot of it was, was it was just the design, too much traffic, you got a parking garage that empties and exits right here. It was a great big issue. So I had to go back and say, this, um, uh, you know, you got too much of an issue, we had somebody get hurt. So uh, watch your training, not only for parking lots and all that, but your training sessions. You don't want to be, you, you don't want to have issues with um, participant safety. We were doing playground safety training this year, uh, this summer, um, with a number of schools in, in different states. And uh, two of the, you know, we're talking about July and you know how thunderstorms can pop up. Um, I, I had to call a session one time because we're out looking at playground equipment and then it starts thundering and lightning. I mean, the last thing I want is somebody from one of my classes to get get struck and hurt by, um, you know, thunder and lightning. So something that you want to think about: event safety, parking lot safety, um, parking stops and bollards. School parking here. Um, this is a school lot. You can see you've got the rebar, so it's it's good to take a look at these, and you can see that uh, um, you know some have been misplaced, some have been kicked around, whatever the case may be, but. That's, a, that's an impalement. Um, that's a life safety issue, having that rebar coming up out of those parking lots, something that you want to pick up on an inspection. Um, this is a um, Illinois school, and you can see the playground equipment. It's right adjacent to the road, and uh, there's no barricade, there's no fencing. So I put that here because um, you, a, a guardrail would be sufficient there, uh, a fence, bollards, whatever the case may be, but something to separate for the safety of the kids, um, the hazard of the traffic of the cars being able to go onto the playground and the safety of the kids. So some, uh, there's a number of other issues with this too, as far as um, too much equipment in a too confined area next to a building, a fence, um, the roadway. But main issue that I wanted to point out here is the fact that you got a traffic exposure right on top of a playground. Um, parking garage. And again, you're not going to see a lot of schools with this setup, but you're going to see schools as um, uh, a security measure having bollards and other means to protect entranceways to significant assets such as an elevator mechanism or the entrance to a school. Something that you want to think about, hey, how can we protect our school entrances and all that? You can, you know, there's, there's great ways to do it through SEPTED, you know, you can have uh, the concrete planters or the bollards or um, other decorative landscaping to protect the entrance, but something that you want to think about. This right here, there is no protection. This is a restaurant, and there's no protection between the diners here and cars coming in and pulling in. You either need the wheels, uh, you need the parking stops, uh, you need some type of barricade there or whatever, but you've got a vehicle pedestrian exposure there that uh, you want to take a look at. Hopefully, and I know schools have these. These things here have cost fatalities. I've seen in workers' comp. Um, so it's a good idea for your inspection program to take a look at. Not only are these are these equipment in oops, I'm sorry, in good working order, uh, but are they properly secured at all times? And where these have presented fatalities, where they somehow or another get unsecured, wind blows them into cars they're driving in. That height of this. It, uh, especially on your smaller cars, right in the windshield. So uh, these, and this right here is from a claim. Um, these are claim photos here of uh, issues with these uh, barricades here that have caused fatalities. So something that you want to take into have an inspection on that, making sure that these are um, um, safe um, and that they're properly secured at all times. Uh, pedestrian. Oops. <coughs> My fat thumb here is uh, jumping the gun here a little bit. More traffic studies. This is a school district here that was wanting some help because it basically was a free-for-all high school. So taking a look at pedestrian vehicle interactions is a good thing for an inspection for a school district. Issue with this school here, um, you had, um, there is no one-way travel. All of the, all the lanes of travel in front of the school, um, the main road coming into the school, they're all two lane. You got buses that come here on the left. You got parents that park here. You got kids coming. You got cars going any general direction. There's very little signage, very little direction. 
So it was important for the school to really get a good handle on their traffic flow. So know from a general perspective on pedestrians. And again, um, you don't need an engineer um, or an architect. It's just basically standing out there and having some common sense on, hey, what's a problem, what's an issue, and how, how, can, we, how can we resolve it? Uh, kind of a funny story, when we did this, um, this was down in the eastern part of Kentucky, and um, the uh, school business office did not tell the school what was going on. They didn't want anybody to be tipped off. They wanted us to see what, norm what happened on a normal day. <coughs> well, that's good and, 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 and well, but me being one of the observers, they had no idea what I was there to do. Was I part of the problem? That's what they all thought. So I had three trans three big burly dudes from the transportation department walk up to me and they go, excuse me, sir, what are you doing here? Why are you taking pictures of kids? Because I was taking pictures, and not of the kids, but of the traffic flow and all that. And I had to, had to commend them. I said, I'm with your insurance company, and we're here to do a safety analysis, a safety inspection. And it, it was good, but I'm going, wow. You know, I, I may have been called, uh, hauled off and never seen again. You know, so, uh, but uh, these are some things that you want to think about. You want to be able to minimize speed as much as possible on your campuses, in front of your buildings. Um, and then sometimes it may take your uh, SRO enforcement, it may take local law enforcement, it may take speed calming devices like bumps or strips or signage is important. Um, having the proper signage for directions and all of that. Some, some things to think about. One, I was at a campus safety conference this past summer and I really got a lot out of it. And uh, Mike Dorn, uh, I don't know if you know Mike from Safe Havens International, but he opened it up the session with a three hour program. And one of the things, and I wish, he, he didn't share his slides, I wish he did. But one of the things that he said that really struck home with me was he said active intruder and all that is very important, but don't forget about the other issues that cause safety concerns in a school. And one of the things that he mentioned, he said on a per annual basis, he had, you have more fatalities in school parking lots than you do in active intruder events. And that really, that really kind of plays to, um, to, to this slide here and talking about vehicle and pedestrian interaction. If I have an issue, my biggest passion when it comes to safety in schools are the kids that get ran over and killed at school bus stops. I mean, you're talking about little kids that somebody disregarding a school bus stop sign and, and then they kill a kid. So that's one of my biggest uh, biggest uh, things that I pay attention to in school, school safety is the protection of the little kids from uh, vehicles. Vehicle cir um, um, circulation, you can see same school district we were talking about here. Buses are coming in, traffic coming in, you got traffic coming this way. This is all in front of the high school and you know something that you don't wanna see. You wanna see one way uh, traffic as much as possible, but you want to separate vehicles. You want um, uh, you want to minimize left-hand turns. Uh, you want to locate vehicle entrance and exits as far as the pedestrians as you can. Um, you want two-lane uh, vehicle and mul uh, large multi-aisle parking lots, two-lane uh, vehicle aisles to facilitate circulation. Uh, all of this are good ideas for vehicular circulation. The uh, slide before that was pedestrians. Signage, I can tell you, I get a lot of consults, regardless of what it is, but uh, do you have any recommendations for signage for um, nature trails or for school parking lots or for school fitness centers? Or So signage is something that is very important. Um, I found this area here, as far as from a legal perspective, having a sign for assumption of risk. Um, in Indiana, this is state law. This sign is absolutely horrible from a risk management perspective. Look, it, it's too many words, it's written too much in legalese, and, but if you, in the state of Indiana, if you're a school and if you want the immunity, this is what you gotta have. Um, and, and what you have here, this is something that I found uh, um, a, a recent court case just this past summer, but you had a, a skier in Colorado on a ski lift and then they ran into a, um, a, a towing vehicle and she had to have her leg amputated. And there was enough, um, she signed the event, there was enough signage and all of that that basically said that you assume that type of a risk. So signage is important, not only can signage be informational, directional, but you can have it there for legal warning, 
um, you want to have you want to make sure that signage that you've got appropriate use of signage we've got a couple of more um, slides that speak to the importance of signage that I really like and wanted to wanted you all to take a look at get some more information out of um, this right here if you guys learn anything at all today how, how many of you all have kids at home young kids at home or you got grandkids young grandkids well you can go back and tell them at today's school safety conference that you learned that Santa Claus does exist and Santa Claus has a police department and that's what this sign here says whoops um, no skateboards allowed local ordinances enforced by Santa Claus Police Department and if you guys are thinking that that's a made-up sign that's a legitimate sign it's on holiday food store in Santa Claus Indiana so um, and then somebody else popped up and they go well Santa Claus obviously doesn't like skateboards either so uh, so if you've learned anything at all today learn that Santa Claus does exist and he's got a uh, police department and Santa Claus is concerned about safety um, this is a good example here of a, a matter of fact this is one of the pictures I took and I sent to that school in Mississippi that I was we showed pictures earlier um, I start the uh, not only do they have directional signage on their campus but they tie it into the entrance doors that are numbered for safety and security reasons I thought that was a great a great thing to incorporate on a on a sign but you want to make sure especially for exterior sign messages and all that that they're easy to understand and read you want them to have a limited number of, of words on them because as you're driving by you've only got a limited amount of time to read it uh, they've got to be clear um, it, it's got to be good location for the day and the night exposures um, you, you've got to consider landscaping uh, the sign because if you got trees and bushes that grow in front the other thing too about signage and landscaping if you, uh, and again I don't think that this is so much applicable in schools but if you've got chemicals that you spray for landscaping, they may affect the sign and uh, you have a shorter life expectancy on the sign due to chemical exposure. Um, I really, really, I get a lot of, as I told you, I get a lot of consults on signage, on various exposures, various industries. And so I'm, all, I'm always scouring the internet for guidance on signs from a, not only from a regulatory standpoint, but just from a risk management standpoint. And I really like this document here from the Veterans Administration. They've got it, and this is, I don't know, three or 400 pages long. It talks about signage for just about every exposure inside a VA facility all across the country. It talks, it gives you the best practices on interior signs, exterior signs, lighted signs, anything and everything. And what I did on this slide and the next slide, I took a couple snippets from this huge document talking about having a sign program. So as you go, uh, this is some good information here. On uh, it's got a link um, in the presentation to the document if you want to take this back with you. Um, and also, you can take a look at is your uh, the signs in your school, uh, both from an interior and pers uh, exterior perspective. Is your sign program older than 15 years? If that that's if it is, that's an indication that may be a good time to update it. Um, do you get a lot of directions or a lot of uh, confusion about where to go? One, um, last, early last year I went to a school in um, southern Mississippi in order to do a traffic uh, analysis for them, traffic observation. And I'd not ever been to that school district and it's one where they had a uh, high school, it, it represented a mini college campus because they had a high school, middle school, and elementary school all on the same campus, a big, a big um, suburban school district. And they had little to no signage. And I got there at 6.30 in the morning with no lights, no signage, and I'm going, wow. Um, I, go, I go, yeah, it's one thing that the community knows where everything is, but if you've got people that don't know where to go, such as myself, uh, signage was something that you needed. Um, and you're taking a look at, are, are you know, your signs, are they consistent? Are they clear in message? Um, one of the things that Campus Safety brought out uh, in the conference that I took that, that I'm going, wow, I didn't think about it. You're um, building entrance signs and your room number signs. Yes, it may be room 101 and maybe building um, entrance number one. Where are those signs posted? Those signs are posted on the exterior, right? But if you're, if you're somebody in an active intruder event and you're, you're not familiar with the building and you're running into, you call first response, first responders and they say where are you at I don't know 
I'm going to have to go out and, and look to see what room I'm in. So one of the recommendations that some of the safety people are making, not a bad idea to put the room numbers and uh, signs not only on the outside, but on the inside of the inside of the room or inside of the building as well. Um, something to think about. So are they mounted in the correct location? Are your interior signs uh, you know, appropriately uh, tapped to the wall? Uh, do you have remodeling or new construction with a different um, um, layout of signage? Does that present issues? Uh, not necessarily, you can see some of this is for health. You aren't gonna have color stripes in the school, but some of these things here, uh, some good things to think about if, uh, in taking a look at and evaluating your sign program from an exterior. Um, they have an um, uh, exterior uh, sign program as well that you can take a look at. Specific areas of signage, um, we talked about you know, uh, nature trails, playgrounds, weight rooms, um, the, uh, your athletic fields. You get a lot of questions about uh, what should a sign say or what should be appropriate to post there. In some situations, you're going to have standards or re state regulations that's going to tell you what you need to put on a sign, such as playgrounds. This right here, what you want to see on playgrounds, you want to see age appropriateness, adult supervision is recommended, um, you want the name of the manufacturer, you want to indicate that playground surfaces can be hot, um, and to wear shoes, draw strings and all that can cause um, fatalities on playgrounds, you, you, you don't, you want to sign. So all of this is uh, recommended components that you see uh, on specific areas, playgrounds there as, a, uh, as an example for signs. Um, light poles, it, the, um, that's not something that you think about that, that uh, needs to be inspected, but you have athletic fields, your football fields, maybe your tennis courts, that you have exterior lighting. Um, 2000, 2001, there was a manufacturer that um, they had a product defect in their light poles and they were having uh, cracks at the welding and these poles fell over. You can, uh, this is a part of the recall. This, you can see what happened to the school gym here where one of the light poles fell on the gym. And um, whenever I go out and I ask schools and we're walking through the athletic fields and all that, I say, when's the last time you had your light poles inspected? And a lot of times they come back and they said, oh, about 2000, 2001 when this was a big issue here. So it's not one of those that, it may be something that you don't want to do every year, but think about these things every so often because uh, not a bad idea to have, since these things are so big, so heavy, and if they fall and they land on something, you're going to have some significant damage as well as, as kids getting hurt. Something to think about that you may want. Not a bad idea to see if, when you have your bleachers inspected, can they take a look at your light poles uh, at the same time? When you have a qualified individual, see if their qualifications can extend the light poles. Um, light poles, this is a picture I took. We did a playground program in um, Columbus, Ohio. And one of the first things we're talking about inspection, gosh darn it, um, we're talking about inspections. Whenever I do an inspection on a playground, very first thing that I do, I don't look at the playground, I look at what's around it, what's above it, what are the hazards associated with the playground itself. Then I look at the playground as far as an inspection standpoint. So as we're walking up and we're, we're holding a multi-school training at this playground facility, lo and behold, this is a light pole for a, um, this was an old high school that was repurposed now to an elementary school. So this is the old football stadium and the light poles uh, that they have at the stadium. You can see the close proximity to this light pole to the playground. And while we're there, gosh, holding class, We've got little kids playing on the playground that can, that can come in contact with this light pole. You can see here that this thing has been hit many times. It's, it's had some type of remedial action to it, but you still had this exposed. And inside, you've got live wires <coughs> exposed to little kids, as well as this outlet here is exposed to little kids. And we're talking about um, these things up being, what, maybe two or three feet up off the ground? perfect for little kids to put their finger in. When I asked the school, I said, what's going on here? They go, well, our tractors and all that, is, we try to cut grass as close to the pole as we can and we keep hitting it and, and damaging it. Nice. And I'm going, and you're gonna risk little kids' lives because you can't get out and you trim. What would you recommend from a risk management standpoint that you do here? And again, and, and I, said, I said, are these live? And they go, we use these fields all the time for with all the youth sports. 
So those, he said, we've got people all over the place all the time. What would you do here from a risk management standpoint? Because from a risk management standpoint, whether you're looking at a playground, bleachers, or anything, you absolutely have to address life safety first. And anything else can be take a back seat to things that can cause serious injury or death. Can this cause serious injury or death? Yeah. So this is something that needs, what would, what would you do from a risk management that, that really, you know, um, you could either relocate that junction box or you could put some poles around it or a fence around a, a chain, something that little kids can't get to it. So, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things that you could do that don't cost a lot of money. But what I also told the school too, was I said, this is, a, this is like a wooden telephone pole. This, this school district had to, uh, this school building had to have been built in the 50s or the early 60s. And I mentioned to tell you that those poles have probably been there that long too. So I'm, I, I said, what, what do these poles look like below grade? And look at the close proximity to these poles to that playground. If that thing falls over on the playground, you're really gonna have problems. So uh, that's just, you know, light poles, but more important than that is just walking around and looking to see what could turn into a problem in, in, a, in schools. I keep wanting to make sure I'm good on time. It's your bike. Good. Uh, as I told you, I have a lot of pictures, a lot of good pictures here. Uh, retention, detention ponds. Uh, pretty much any commercial building, whether you're a school district, I get, I get three or four consults a year just on retention and detention ponds, safety around it. This is a school in South Carolina. And uh, this is, oh, gosh darn, right in the middle, I'm gonna put using this pointer. <laughs> um, right around the perimeter is their athletic fields. Football fields, um, um, practice fields, tennis, playgrounds, and this retention pond is right in the middle. What, um, the very first thing that I saw was they have these uh, bushes that are at least four feet high all the way around it. Um, any, you know, it's there for decorative purposes because, you know, they, they you know, and it's a, it's a fence, so to speak. Then they've got a four foot chain link fence behind it. Um, anybody have, um, have any issues with that? Have any concerns with this setup? Think, think what, what is our next topic that we're going to talk about this morning? active intruder so if you've got if I'm going to do an event uh, if, if I'm going to do some school violence in an uncontrolled area that has a lot of people where am I going to want to store weapons or backpack full of whatever whatever mean and nasty things I'm going to do exactly and that thing goes all the way around so not only is that good to hide things in but you can hide people in there too um, I'm going to point Manually. Take a look at this arrow here. You can see um, kids and all of that have jumped the fence. Uh, that the top rail has been pushed down, as well as that picture over there. You can't really see it, but fencing is pushed put down too. That tells me that kids are getting in there. Maybe balls or whatever the case may be. So if that fence there is to protect kids from the retention pond, not doing a very good job. Uh, you probably you're going to need to take as far as retention ponds and all of that. It can drill down to your individual city, as far as city codes on fence heights, gate requirements, gate locks. But um, not every retention pond has to have a fence. Just depends upon the specific nature of it, the hazards, the slope, the depth of the pond. They recommend not having a fence if you don't have to, because it can delay um, first responders in the event of an emergency. Uh, there are some, extra, so it, uh, for this particular school here, um, from a safety perspective, the, the, um, uh, the landscaping presents a problem. Four foot <coughs> fence uh, is not really doing what it's supposed to be doing and keeping kids out. So uh, I would be rethinking what we would want to do to make this retention pond safer. Um, you have two excellent resources. These are my go-to resources whenever we talk about retention pond. And, I, and I, regardless of the industry, any large commercial, I mean your homeowners association, all of that have to have retention ponds. It's just something that, difference between a retention pond and a detention pond. Um, a retention pond is something that will take runoff water and keep it until it's evaporated. A detention pond will hold water all the time with fountains and all that type of a deal. But they're both there for water drainage uh, purposes. So 
take a look at um, if, if this is something that you have on your campuses. And I've gotten consults in schools too about, hey, we want to locate a playground next to a, a detention pond. What do you suggest? What should, should the height of the fence be? As a general rule, you at least want a six foot fence. But these are two excellent documents here that can give you some guidance, some good risk management on retention or detention ponds. Fencing. You have a lot of different, you have a lot of fencing on school property, and that's something that the safety experts recommend for active intruder. Um, fencing perimeters, controlling access, um, you know, into your property. So fencing is an important component and something that you need to inspect um, on a regular basis. Different fencing have different requirements. Uh, you can see from a safety perspective, athletic fencing. Anything below, I, these are, um, it's not code, but it's uh, best practices for safety. Um, anything below, um, I think it's eight feet, it's good to have the plastic top rail, the yellow or whatever, because if you get in an athletic, if you've got athletes that are running and on um, anything six foot or less, and um, they don't have the, uh, it's good to, to point this out from an uh, observation standpoint that they know an obstacle is coming up. Day and age of concussions, uh, sports concussions and all of that, something important to think about. Same thing too, we've got consults on um, batting cages for baseball fields. Should they have a fence in front of it? What should the height be? Can't tell you my claims days and risk management days, the number of what's the fence height requirement, what's the backstop, uh, how far should the baseball backstops be because the foul balls keep hitting the neighbor's parked cars on the street and you got damaged windshields and all that. So you've got some good risk management information on proper fencing. This um, middle picture there with the pole, that's a playground, um, and it's got a fencing separating out the vehicular traffic from the playground. This is an outlet mall, a national outlet mall chain that has a playground in each one of their um, outlet malls. And obviously with an outlet mall, you've got huge traffic exposure, so all of their outlet malls have fencing around playgrounds to separate out the vehicle exposure. So just some information here about baseball, softball fencing that you can take back if you look to see if it's appropriate. Taking a look at fencing um, and not the five foot, the 10 foot, yeah, or you stand outside and you go, uh, everything looks good, but actually walk the perimeter. Take a look at your fencing. Got a couple of lessons from losses on fencing. Here's one of them. In this particular case here, track and field, grandma's watching her granddaughter go to the track and field event. And um, you, got the, you got the entry gate here. You got the center post that sticks up, water been er eroding around. Grandma doesn't see it and down she goes. Six figure claim. And you know what? Take a look at this fence. This thing does absolutely nothing. There is no purpose at all for this thing to be there. This picture on the right, uh, this in essence is what the school got. This is what the school paid for. They paid for something that they didn't get. So what happened here, what they were supposed to get were poles that were gonna go into the ground. And then they got this thing here um, that does absolutely nothing and it caused a slip, trip, and fall. So take a look at, not only are you getting what you're paying for, but ask questions, take a look at an inspection, uh, and catch something like this before it turns into a loss. Uh, in this event here, I don't know how the claim ultimately resolved, but um, whoever the um, contractor uh, was that installed it's got some exposure there if the statute of limitations didn't run to bring them in on it too. Um, another fencing example, playground. <laughs> you've got a little girl, you've got a deep depression due to use going in and out of the playground, the playground's fence. It had rained the day before and that had water had basically filled up the entrance way to the playground. The only way to get in without getting wet is to walk close to the poles. You can see this bolt sticking here out. That's what grabbed a hold of her leg on the left hand side, she tore that thing open. It's out of six figure settlement. Uh, so, I mean, you know, I mean, that's it. It's not a playground equipment loss, but it's a fencing issue to a school campus. To walk around and, and all you really have needed was to cut that bolt back. Not anything, no great big money or anything like that to make that kind of a claim go away. Um, nature trails. I'm getting a, a lot of elementary schools, and again, it doesn't pay to live near, or for me to live near your school district. So, uh, 
Uh, I point this at home, by the way, that's, um, you know, that's uh, Rocky the school safety dog down there. But um, a lot of elementary schools have land um, that they utilize for nature trails or fitness trails or whatever the case may be. And, uh, and I enjoy the heck out of them. But if you don't maintain them properly, uh, this was taken just a couple months ago. The school had, had for years and years really taken care of the trail. Now they got all kinds of dead trees that are in the path. And you can see that these things have been cut. So the school's aware of it. And they've taken a natural condition and turned it into a, uh, an, uh, uh, they've taken an, art or a, an artificial condition now by uh, coming in and trimming those tree limbs and all that. And we have seen accidents. I had a bad accident in Ohio on a nature trail where kids went into the nature trail, took hammocks, and decided they would hang hammocks from the trees and they, hang, they hung one from a rotted tree. Uh, kids got on a hammock, that tree fell on them and you ended up with a very serious injury. School came to me and, and they basically said, should we have signage or what should we do? Should we have signage that says don't install hammocks? And I go, no. I wouldn't, don't, you, want to, you don't want to put a sign for anything and everything. But it gets back to the slide that we talked about before, about posting signage for various sources where what you would want to see, and I went to the National Park Service about what you want to see on nature trails. I think I got this on another slide, DNR and all that, but you want the assumption of risk sign for sure. You know, use at your own risk, park hours, adult supervision is uh, recommended, all of that good kind of stuff. But I wouldn't put a sign at the beginning of the trail, you know, it says no hanging hammocks. Uh, that should go under use at your own risk type of a deal. But um, moral of the story here on this is this thing here um, with the fact that the school has basically abandoned this nature trail. And that's going to create issues and hazards if you still have this open to the public. One of the things that this school does, this is the same elementary school that I showed you that had the washed out playground. Uh, with the crown parking that washed away. One, one of their playgrounds is right to the adjacent of this nature trail. And it's so far away from the school building, but yet you've got neighborhood communities, you, you've got a lot of, you've got um, open access from a sexual misconduct, from a school violence, from a, a child safety perspective. That area right there, if I'm gonna look at uh, committing violence or kidnapping a kid or whatever, that is an easy opportunity for me to do that with the layout of that playground next to these. Uh, so far away from the school and, and, and next to a hazard like this that it's awfully easy to hide to present an opportunity. Um, Nature Trails, Minnesota DNR has a great publication, a lot of national links to that document there on uh, trail guides and all of that. But, this gives you a good, I'm not gonna go through it all, but it gives you a good snippet of, if you have nature trails, if you have fitness trails and all that, how to maintain them, um, what are the different classes that you have, you know, uh, whether it's paved, it's two ways, whether you allow horses, bicyclists, or it's just a pedestrian trail, or whatever the case may be. Um, it also talks about maintenance, frequency, and inspection of that too. So if that's something that you have, um, it may be commonly overlooked, but something that you may want to think about looking at in the future. Um, this is a, this slide here I put in. Um, I don't know if it's in your yeah, it's in your materials. But um, somebody pointed this out at a session I was in last week in North Carolina, talking about commonly overlooked. You've got in your school auto shop classes. If you've got hydraulic lifts, when's the last time that they've been inspected and certified? These things can fail. This one here was a picture I got off the internet where it failed and caused the vehicle to fall down. So it's not uncommon for these things to fail. When's the last time that they've been inspected? I provided you the latest ANSI standards for standard automotive lift safety requirements. Um, requires, and again, this is not Illinois code, it's not Illinois law, this is a standard, a voluntary standard that says that all this should be uh, inspected annually by a qualified inspector. So, um, you may want to go back to your schools if you got this exposure and say, hey, by the way, when's the last time we've had this, this lift inspected? If it's been never or if it's been a really long time, maybe something you want to think about doing. Um, inside a building, um, I, I've gotten a number of consults over the years about personal appliances in a school. And you, you can see sometimes um, people bring things in. A lot of times you don't even know they're there until you actually go out and inspect them. 
that people bring them in on the slide, so to speak. You know, uh, whether it's a refrigerator or whether it's a, a heating fan or a, a cooling fan or a microwave or a coffee maker or whatever the case may be. Are you overloading circuits? This picture there, I don't think you can really see it, but you've got extension cord running along the ceiling down the side, and so you've got uh, you don't have proper proper electrical safety going on in that classroom there. So you've got building codes, uh, you've got state building codes that address this. So something that you just may want to walk around, do some inspections, looking to see what's going on. Do you have things, personal refrigerators, um, use of any extension cord? Uh, daisy chaining power strips, any of these things here that um, if you don't have a policy, um, you may want to think about doing. A lot of times, the um, schools have come to me and said, hey, we want to implement a uh, personal appliance device. Can you give us fire safety statistics on, to help us sell this recommendation to our staff? And actually, no, I mean, uh, a lot of these, if they're UL certified and all that, uh, it's prevented large school fires, but knowing a large school fire, it's not the fire itself that's the main um, driving force behind the loss, behind the money, it's the water damage. I mean, you may have an actual area with fire that may be a really small room, but it's the sprinklers going off, it's, it's the first response. That right there is, is really where, where the money gets you uh, in addressing fire loss. But where I've come back when schools have asked for this information about fire, I said, no. I said, you better go, it's better for you to go from a uh, energy conservation standpoint, from the fact that if you're running a lot of these electrical devices, it's gonna save the school district a lot of money and there's some studies on consumption of all these appliances and, and what that means. So from a dollars and cents standpoint, um, not only does it present a fire hazard, but from a, a conservation of energy standpoint, it makes sense to do that. Um, I, this is where I get to be a Grinch, and I guess you guys can get to, get to be a Grinch too, uh, for holiday um, celebrations in a school. Uh, as far as um, electrical devices, you should have um, uh, a process in place or inspect what get brought in from a school from a lighting standpoint, from a, an extension cord standpoint, from a power strip, are you, do you have proper electrical safety? Are the decorations, are they approved? Are they fire retardant? Are they too much? Uh, all of that can kind of go into play. And I throw in this here about, well, what does all this have to do with drinking and driving and holidays? Schools can do, I don't think it's, this is the next slide. Um, yeah, it is. Schools can, uh, can have events where alcohol is served and you may have a social host or a, uh, an exposure for liability for um, um, serving alcohol, for drinking and driving and all of that. I got involved in a consult, this was in uh, Northern Ohio, and the school had uh, just opened a state-of-the-art auditorium. They were bringing in national, but this was all owned and controlled by the school district. And as a result, what they were wanting to do on the grand opening night was serve alcohol uh, at a school function, and they were looking at getting proper board approval and all of that in front of three or 400 people. I'm going, that is a heck of a lot of exposure for social host or for liquor liability from a school district standpoint. Um, and then I was presenting this at another conference and um, one of the principals of the, of the conference pulled me aside and goes, Steve, you wouldn't believe that's not a unique ex um, exposure or whatever. There may be a number of events that schools do where alcohol is served where if they don't have the proper controls in place, they may be subject to liability for drinking and driving uh, for issues that result. Um, so uh, take a look at, ask, ask a lot of questions on um, social, if you're, if you're serving alcohol at events. And um, the, um, this is a, a toolkit here from the uh, state of Wisconsin, I believe, that talks about these are some things to put, these are a, a community toolkit for alcohol <laughs> management. Um, it's something that if this is something that um, you're looking at doing, good risk management advice for you to take a look at. Steve, meeting. Steve, yeah, so that, that, that doesn't necessarily have to be on their premises. I mean, they could be, they could host it at a <laughs> off-site location. Off location. Well, yeah, sure. And they're still susceptible to that liability if they are hosting that party. Absolutely. So let's say that this event here was hosted by a school district and Pat was serving alcohol 
or um, the school district was serving alcohol and there was an event, you may have against that serving organization. So even if the district is not providing the alcohol, um, turn, a lot a lot of school districts will have have a, uh, a holiday gathering at a, a local restaurant. restaurant where the district provides the food and a non-alcoholic beverage. And if if right. the uh, people want alcoholic beverages, they purchase that on their own. Well, it's going to get into a case by case. If it's a company event uh, or a school function, a business event, and they tolerated alcohol, you may have a supervision component attached to it to make sure that if it's that everybody uh, uh, operates appropriately. If somebody is, is under the influence or exhibiting signs of intoxication, did you offer them additional transportation? Did you do you know? So you may have exposure, but it's going to be a case by case. Uh, but alcohol is, is tricky. It's alcohol exposure is real tricky. Um, yes, sir. About a holiday party where maybe the uh, the union is hosting the party and administration is invited to it. Hmm. Well, it's going to get into it's, it's going. To, you're, you're looking at contracts now. You're looking at who's controlling the event, who does what, what is specific. So it's uh, let's put it this way: in a lawsuit, anybody and everybody's going to get sued. Anything else? I do um, liquor liability training for restaurants and all of that too, um, and it's it's a really tough exposure. This particular event here, um, we were meeting with the town of Wisconsin up on, on the Lake Michigan. We asked them what they had as far as uh, liquor liability controls in place because they they host an annual festival for Harley's and, and all of that, you know, bike you know weekend and all that, and they serve alcohol. And he goes, Steve, you have to understand this is Wisconsin. We like to drink beer here. And I'm going, you can still get sued in Wisconsin. So we, you, you do need to take a look at uh, alcohol management and have the proper controls in place because, yeah. And, and a lot of times, a lot of these uh, drinking and driving accidents, um, your um, the responsible party who may have been under the influence, uh, what's normal for? Um, um, Personal auto coverage limits in Illinois, 100, 300, 255? Yeah, 100, 300. Is that going to go very far when somebody's seriously injured or killed? So they're, look, they're going to be looking for the deep pockets. And if it, it's a school event, like what we said before, plan of attorney is going to shotgun anybody and everybody. So if you have these exposures, talk to Pat. Hey, we're thinking about having a party or whatever the case may be. We're thinking about serving alcohol. What do we need to do from a risk management standpoint or from an insurance coverage standpoint? So we want to talk to your agent. And then they can, they can put you in touch with risk control and take, make sure that you're protected from a coverage standpoint. Um, let's see how much time we got left. We've only got uh, about five minutes. Yeah, about five minutes. Storage areas, you want to make sure that you, you've addressed. Uh, you can take a look, as I talked about before. Take a look at your storage areas. What do you have stored in them? Um, more pictures you can see these are just issues that you're using hallways and all that for storage areas um, HVAC you know electrical supplies you've got uh, stuff stored too close to the top in front of the electrical power dis uh, distribution boxes uh, um, you know sprinklers and all that present problems uh, mechanical rooms that's a good example that's not a good example uh, how do you like you have these um, Gasoline powered equipment next to electrical transformers. Not, it's something that you just walk around saying, we can't have this on our school district. Um, what do you think about clearances here? More along the line, you got um, electrical switch panels back there. You get, getting to them is good luck. Same thing here. Um, some inspection areas, these are just common sense things from electrical flammables. Stage and auditoriums, stage safety. Not only, not only from the stage itself, but from the workshops and all the storage areas behind it can present problems. Take a look at your upper balconies. Do they present fall issues uh, where, where people can fall? Uh, not only, you, know, you want to make sure you can see the production, but you want to be safe for, for people as well so they don't fall. Um, these are some other areas to think about for stages, orchestra pits where people can fall in. Excellent guide, resource document here on K through 12 school theaters. I go to this a lot for school um, theater, for stage rigging, for um, P 
Peter Plan for flying instructors and pyrotechnics and all. It, it's a great resource to have. It addresses all of that. So that kind of takes us to the end of the role. Steve, road on, back on that other slide, you said you have documentation for this. Yes. We do have some uh, schools that put on plays, and they're pretty, pretty nice and extensive, and I think that would probably be good. Uh, Absolutely, it's an excellent book, and I go to I go to a lot because we had a lot of consults on, hey, we're, we're thinking about having Willy Wonka or Peter Pan, or, and we we think we can we can fly these performers ourselves, and you read that book, and they're saying the the major stage productions in New York have problems flying performers. You know, why do you think a 22 year old theater um, director thinks that they can do that? Uh, so it, it's not not only does it illustrate what we say, but it really gives you a background from a professional perspective on risk management and what you want to do and what you don't want to do. Um, so I'll be happy to make that link available because um, I use that about five or six times a year with different school issues on that. Um, these are just some important takeaways, and that really kind of wraps up my presentation. So I, I do want to thank you all for your time. Hopefully, you got some some good information out of it and. Um, it looks like you've got a great rest of the day with the great agenda and then the ball. So thank you all very much.